Hi guys, David here from Almost Daily Science. So today I want to talk about the topic of science fraud. So this week there's been an update to a pretty high profile case of scientific misconduct in the area of spider ecology. And so we're going to talk about uh, this article here from science.org and see if we can learn a little bit about the background and that will kind of be a jumping off point for us to sort of address the topic of scientific fraud at large. So the article says, almost two years after a Twitter storm erupted over data problems, including the possibility of fabrication in more than a dozen scientific papers co-authored by a behavioral ecologist, Jonathan Pruitt, the saga may be nearing a climax. A spokesperson for Pruitt's current employer, McMaster University, told Science Insider on November 12th that the school's investigation has now concluded and Pruitt has been placed on paid administrative leave until the process is complete. Also last week, researchers learned the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, which was his uh, alma mater, withdrew Pruitt's dissertation from its library system, although it remains unclear whether his PhD has been revoked. Moreover, 12 of the ecologist's papers have been retracted so far and expressions of concern have been posted for 10 others according to the Retraction Watch database. So the article also explains some background is that Pruitt's star rose quickly in behavioral ecology over the last 15 years. He has co-authored 173 research papers according to Google Scholar and in 2015 he was named to Popular Science's Brilliant 10. In 2018 he was selected for a prestigious Canadian faculty position, one of just 24 Canadian uh, 150 research chairs. Yeah, so you can see by his Google Scholar uh, profile, which is basically, if, if you're not aware, um, most researchers set up a Google Scholar account, which basically keeps track of their papers and how many times those papers have been cited. And this is more or less the scorecard for academic researchers. The idea is that you want to have lots of papers and you want your papers to get cited, which means they're referenced in other people's papers lots of times. And this becomes one of the key metrics by which you're judged by your peers. But it says his career started to unravel in late 2019 when a collaborator, behavioral ecologist Kate Laskowski at the University of California, Davis, was alerted to data problems, such as measurements that seem to repeat themselves in one of their papers. My guess is that was probably a grad student was probably parsing the data and, and found something kind of fishy. She subsequently found issues with two more papers, all of which were eventually retracted. Then in January 2020, she blogged about her experience. So the article goes on to describe how initially he claimed like, you know, hey, I made a mistake. There were some data management issues. But upon investigating, his collaborators and his reviewers and critics basically found that the mistakes he had made were too suspicious in nature. You sure you might have copied the wrong Excel table into the wrong file a couple of times, and maybe that causes a couple of papers to be retracted. But when you have something like a dozen papers are all being retracted because of data management issues, it maybe it's not data management issues. Maybe it goes beyond just a little innocent mistake, and maybe actually you're looking at true scientific fraud and that's really what people have contended what's interesting is i found um by looking at the hashtag pruitt data thread on twitter i, I see that different scientists are kind of weighing in here's an ecologist uh, she says paid leave for a corrupt scientist quote unquote scientist secret conclusions from misconduct investigations outrageous we need transparency especially when so many people's careers publication records aspirations and mental health have been directly impacted hashtag Pruitt data and what she's referring to is the fact that um, his university has as we said before done an investigation and they've placed him on paid leave but they haven't disclosed the results of the investigation and it's not clear if they will hopefully they do because honestly when someone is engaged in science fraud you know you think at first glance like well that's just going to affect a, a few people but it really does affect a lot of people and the people that it affects it can affect in a big way obviously when the results eventually come out of fraud your career is ruined so that's not good for you but it also affects basically everyone that published with this guy it's essentially a black mark on your career. E even if you yourself are cleared of any academic wrongdoing, there's still the fact that you spent a lot of time working on this data, working on this research, and now all of that is just crossed off. It doesn't help your career in any way. And in some cases, especially when you're earlier in your career, the amount of time that you might spend on a publication is not trivial. 
in some cases, especially if you're a grad student, we're talking about you know, like a year of your life that you can't get back. And not only can you not get it back because it was wasted, but it actually hurts your career. It's worse than wasted. Scientific fraud also hurts people who might try to replicate your data. So it's not uncommon for a new graduate student in grad school to be assigned the task of replicating the results from a notable paper that was recently published. So for instance, you might be assigned to replicate one of Jonathan Pruitt's papers, and then after that, you'll do a different experiment that will, that will kind of move the needle forward in the field. However, if Jonathan Pruitt's data was all fabricated, then that means that you're probably not going to be able to replicate this work. What that means practically is that you will spend the first year of grad school fruitlessly trying to replicate something which will never replicate because it never happened in the first place. You might feel suicidal, you'll feel depressed, you might even drop out of grad school. Um, that's. <laughs> I probably shouldn't examine too much the fact that I put <laughs> dropping out of grad school as worse than suicide in my little rant. Um, let's not read into that too much. She needs to sort out her priorities. Anyway, the point is that it really affects a lot of people. Not only that, but a lot of times scientific research is funded by taxpayer dollars. And I think that people would prefer to think that the funding that they are indirectly giving to scientific research is at the very least being spent in an honest way. You know, that people aren't actually lying and then profiting by their lies. So how do you prevent something like this from happening? Well, I think a big part of it comes from just uh, talking about stuff like this. I think the more people talk about Jonathan Pruitt's case, the more people will uh, avoid going down this route themselves. And actually, uh, I think a big part of this in my own life was that in my first year of grad school, we actually were part of a, a, a book club class. It was uh, kind of like a scientific ethics class, but it was more than that. It was, you know, touched on a lot of different topics. But one of the things we did is we actually read this book here, Plastic Fantastic, How the Biggest Fraud in Physics Shook the Scientific World, which is an excellent book that I recommend. And it's actually very painful to read because it's basically the story of um, how this rising star physicist, uh, Jan Hendrik Schoen, faked the discovery of a new superconductor at the world famous Bell Laboratories. And what happens is that the journalist kind of uncovers that it looks like this guy started to lie about his scientific results relatively early in his career and the lies were maybe small at first and perhaps they were motivated by stress you know maybe he was stressed out because oh man um, graduate school is hard and there's a lot of pressure to have good results and if you don't have good results then maybe other people will look down on you or maybe you'll have to drop out or something like that so he started to lie a little bit and then the lies started to get a little bit bigger as he got away with them and eventually he was lying to the point he was he was getting um, huge accolades. He was his career was advancing really, really fast. He was being praised at conferences and getting extra funding. He was getting subordinates working for him all at Bell Laboratories. And and people were like, wow, maybe this guy is going to be like a Nobel Prize winner. He's he's truly uh, really shaking, shaking the world up. The only issue is that it started to be that nobody could replicate his work. And at first he would kind of gaslight them, like they would call him up and be like, oh, Dr. Schoen, you know, I, I couldn't replicate your work. Um, and he's like, well, you're probably doing it wrong. It's kind of tricky. And he would like sometimes like fly out there and then like um, try to like help them set their stuff up. And he'd be like, well, you have the wrong components or something. And then he'd like fly back home. People would come to his lab and be like, well, can you show us how you do it in your lab? And he's like, oh, well, you know, the equipment broke down, so I can't show you today, but come back another time and I'll show you. And there's a limit, obviously, to how long you can pull something like that off. And eventually it came out that he was a fraud and it was really impactful. He, like this guy, um, well, I don't know if Jonathan Pruitt is gonna have his PhD revoked, but this guy had his PhD revoked and he became one of the most hated names in science. And for good reason, because 
he really fooled a lot of people. And again, you think like, well, what's the point? But there were people who uh, tried to replicate his work, spent years of their life trying to replicate his work and, and couldn't. And that's heartbreaking, especially when you're in the beginning of your career, all of your hopes dashed because you're thinking like, well, I can't replicate Dr. Schoen's work. I must be a terrible scientist. I must suck. I'm horrible. And the whole time, the reason you can't replicate it is because it never happened in the first place. The thing that scared me the most about this was the fact that it looks like his lies started out so small. And I think that's the lesson actually, is that when you're doing science or really doing anything that involves a degree of trust or integrity, you should put layers of accountability. What this looks like actually is synonymous with um, increasing rigor. So for example, there are things that scientists can do to keep themselves honest about their data. Now I've noticed that when I am analyzing data that I measured, sometimes if I have a narrative in mind, like I think there's a specific mechanism and it works a specific way, I find myself, you know, hoping that the data will come out to match my presupposition. And if it does, I'm happy. And if it doesn't, I'm, I'm disappointed. But there's always some subjectivity to how you work up or analyze data. So for instance, if you are um, measuring a specific curve, you might need to manually place the boundaries upon which the software will measure that curve. And maybe if you know that you hope the number will be large, maybe you just sort of imperceptibly put the boundaries a little bit wide around the curve so that the number will be a little higher. There's little things that you might do like that, sometimes without even realizing that kind of massaging the data to support what it is that you want to believe. Well, there's a really simple way to prevent this, and it's actually called blinding. And one way to do this is to have your colleague analyze and work up your data and not tell him or her what it is that you expect to find. Say, hey, I have these curves. I would love it if you could integrate them and give me the results in a table. Um, I'd be happy to return the favor for you. In the meantime, I'm not going to include any, any like information about the data so that there will be no temptation to sort of massage the data. And so if he or she comes back and the data fits your presupposition, that's exciting because that's a result that you can trust. And there are little things that you can do basically to enhance the rigor of your work. And at the same time, it basically puts walls in between you and the temptation for fraud. For this reason, I think the, the lesson in this is not to look at this guy and be like, wow, he's a monster, he's a terrible person, but to look at him with some sympathy and say, you know what? Um, he's a human being, and at some point he probably made a small decision to blur the lines, and that most likely evolved into full-blown data fabrication and fraud. Now, it's possible that he's, you know, maybe more of like a sociopathic type, and he's just been like sort of lying without any kind of qualms of conscience for like for a really long time, but my guess is, is that he started off probably in a very, um relatable situation like he was stressed he wanted some data and he just oh let me just like massage the data and I actually have another story about that uh, my thesis advisor told me a story about a colleague of his I believe I'm not sure if it was in grad school or if when he was doing research in a different institution but he noticed his friend was was working really hard on something and he said hey what, what are you working on and he said well I'm modifying my NMR data um, to correct it and he said, well, what do you mean? I mean, the data is the data, right? And he said, well, no, no, the, the data is not really coming out right. So I'm correcting it. I'm correcting the curve to have the right um, shape. So I'm looking up, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fitting, fitting an equation to it and, and, and modifying the underlying data. And my thesis advisor, you know, who was a grad student at the time is thinking, that doesn't really sound right. Like you don't, you interpret the data <laughs> And you might change the way you interpret the data, you know, if you have a good reason for it, but you don't change the underlying data to fit your interpretation. And what was going on was this guy was basically telling himself that what he was doing was okay because he was just he was just a hundred percent sure about his results. And okay, there was this little like pesky detail, like the data didn't match it, but the data was wrong, you know, I mean, because his conclusion was right. And so 
Apparently this guy got in this habit and eventually he was caught. And I don't know, you know, the whole story about him, but I do know that he actually did commit suicide. Um, and I think that being caught in scientific fraud was a contributing factor to that. And so this is really serious. You know, you, you know, you could start off with kind of an innocent approach or innocent perspective and get caught up in something that eventually might lead to you wanting to take your own life. And I really hope that Jonathan Pruitt does not commit suicide. I, I hope that if he is feeling depressed, which he should feel depressed, he should feel ashamed and sad. I hope that he does um, not take any kind of desperate measures and that he is able to uh, basically change his ways. And I think that he should not be a scientist anymore, but that he should find a, uh, a lifestyle and a career that he can do honestly and basically uh, get a second chance at, at life. I, I don't think he should be ruined for life or anything like that, but I don't think he should be a scientist anymore. I think that I think that lying is basically the opposite of what science should be. And when you're a scientist, especially an experimentalist, the idea is that experimental science is a chance for you to be confronted by truth in a small way. We, we don't generally speaking as experimental scientists uh, get a chance to answer like the profound questions of life. It's usually something small like how does this molecule work when it interacts with this other molecule? Or how is it that spider ecology works? Or, or what are the social lives of spiders like? It's not like any one of those little results is going to revolutionize the world most likely but it is a small piece of truth and basically you come at it with an with an opinion and then you do the experiment and the experiment should change your opinion and when you go about this uh from the opposite point of view when you go and say hey i have an opinion and now the data needs to change to fit my opinion it's the complete opposite of that i don't think you should be a scientist if you have a record of scientific fraud well anyway you can probably tell that this is uh an emotional issue for me i think it is for for every scientist really because basically what we're what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to be excruciatingly honest we should be above reproach uh and so it's always a really big bummer when one of these things come out and I think that the conclusion is that um, we need to talk about stuff like this more. You know, maybe maybe it feels sensitive. Maybe we shouldn't bring this guy's name up or publicly shame him or something like that. But I actually think it's the opposite. I think the more we talk about cases like this, I think it will prevent it from happening. I, I hope that if you happen to watch this and you're a researcher or you're thinking of going into science, that your conclusion will be, I want to be 100% honest even if it means my career doesn't take off as much as I would like it. Uh, and I also recommend, and this is interest, this should be interesting if, if, even if you're, if you're not a scientist or if, if you're not interested in science that much, I do recommend this book, Plastic Fantastic. It did definitely make an impact on me, and it's actually just a pretty good story from a journalistic point of view anyway. So anyway, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If it was useful or entertaining in any way, please go ahead and like and subscribe, and I hope you'll join me again in the future soon. Bye.